San Diego State University, who's uh, done a lot of theoretical work as, lot, as well as a lot of very good applications work using um, approximate techniques, approximations to the St. Clonon equations. And that's what he's going to talk about this morning, is uh, some of the comparisons and meanings of more simplified approaches to unsteady flow modeling. OK, I guess we, we could get started here. In this second lecture, we're going to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty, if you wish, the mathematics. Um, hopefully, once we get through that, um, uh, we will be able to make some sense and understand what the concepts that Seddon was trying to convey to us, uh, namely, what the kinematic wave, uh, wave is all about. In order to study the kinematic wave, we need to base our analysis on two principles. The principle of conservation of mass is one of them. The principle of conservation of mass basically says, for those of you that are, uh, that are looking at a review of this, it says that if you have a volume controlled, if there's a, a, a control volume, if there's a rate of flow coming in, if, if that same rate of flow is not coming out, then somehow the volume is increasing. The storage inside that volume is increasing or decreasing if the rate of flow that is coming out is greater than the rate of flow going in. So this could be expressed in many ways, but one way that we have uh, shown to ourselves that makes sense in, um, in unsteady flow is this way, where we say that the, the rate of change or the gradient of the discharge has to be balanced by the rate of change in time of the flow area. And the units in this equation are consistent. And that this equation also implies that there is no source or sink. Because if there were a source or sink, then we would have to put it in here. OK, and that's subject of more detailed studies, uh, which we, you may cover later on. So this is a basic equation of conservation of mass. Again, I repeat. If a discharge that's coming in does not go out, then within a period of time, that volume has to go into increasing the storage. This, unfortunately, is a differential equation. And it is a partial differential equation. And we all realize that in order to solve partial differential equations, technically, we cannot do it in a closed form, fully in a closed form. And it has to be done, done by using numerical methods, computer techniques, algorithms, and so on. But this is just half of the statement of a kinematic wave. The other half is, theoretically, the conservation of momentum. We have to conserve momentum if we want to describe a, a full wave. However, as far as the kinematic wave is concerned, we substitute a steady flow equation for the conservation of momentum. So we say Manning's could be used in lieu of the conservation of momentum. And we, all, we know from, from this morning that we could express this equation like this, q equal to alpha a to the beta, which is another way of saying this is a rating curve, uniform flow, equilibrium, Manning type of equation. Now then, you may say, or so some people may ask, well, if this is Manning, there, where, if this is Manning, and Manning we all know is steady flow, then where is the unsteadiness? We're supposed to be talking about unsteady flow. The answer is here, right there. Right there is the unsteadiness. So in essence, what we're doing in here is, is we're combining an unsteady flow equation, as far as mass is concerned, with the steady flow equation as far as momentum is concerned. When you put together an unsteady component with a steady component, what you get out down in the wash, like they say, is unsteady, <laughs> for obvious reasons, right? So it is an unsteady flow concept in this kinematic wave, OK? So we take the equation of Seddon. We take the QDA. We've already seen this is equal to beta QA, beta V. This is the kinematic wave celerity. If we multiply, and this is just one way of doing this, and it's a rather uh, straightforward way of doing this, but there are other ways, uh, and this formula that I'm going to present to you in here has been proven in the literature to be the case. 
This is the kinematic wave equation, this here. And it's somewhat different from this one. And how is it derived? It's derived by multiplying this equation by dq dA. So if you multiply by dq dA, which is c sub w, you end up with c sub w dq dx, which is in here, right? And dq dA times dA dt, you cancel the dAs, and you're left with dq dt. In essence, what we have done is we have multiplied this equation by this equation, which represents, in a certain way, the concept of uh, kinematic wave, the velocity of the kinematic wave. So we get this equation in here which is now a differential equation, somewhat different than this equation, and it has an advantage. The advantage is that in this equation, we only have one variable, q. In this other equation, we have two variables. So in here, we had to couple these to solve the problem, because we had two equations, we needed, we had two unknowns, and we needed two equations. In here, we only have one unknown, q. So we have coupled this, these two equations into one equation, which we can now, presume, and in fact, indeed it does represent the kinematic flow problem. Interestingly enough, if we took, this equation looks very similar to a total differential. Let me show you why. You take from your studies of calculus, I'm sure going back to a number of years, I don't want to mention, uh, I'm sure uh, a few, uh, dq, total differential, is equal to partial q with respect to t, times delta t, uh, or dt, plus partial q with respect to x times delta x. So now we take dt in here, and we say dq dt is equal to dq dt, right? Because we took this in the denominator, times dx dt, dt here in the denominator. And if we are willing to assume from, for a moment that this part of this equation is equal to this part, which indeed it is, because CW is dx dt, is the celerity, is the change in space, okay? And this is a little bit fuzzy, but uh, this is how everybody does it, by the way. We're willing to, ass uh, uh, to assume, let me tell you that, that, that this has been thoroughly proven to be the case in practice. And why I, well, the reason why I said it's a little bit fuzzy is because I needed to do this in a few minutes. You can go back to the theory and perhaps spend five hours and do it and satisfy for yourself that it is indeed the case. But we don't have that time here. And I believe, you know, we have done it several times, so. Okay, so if we, we are willing for a moment to admit that the C is indeed this, which in fact it is, then we can say then this dq dt, this dq dt is zero because this equation is the same as this equation and is zero, which says that since the q dt is zero, q does not change in time for waves traveling with velocity c sub w, c sub w, when c sub w is the velocity of these waves, because based on the work of Seddon and so on. So we conclude from this mathematics, which like I said, you'll have to take my word for it at this time, later on you can do your own, uh, your own research to demonstrate to yourself that the kinematic wave is a one, one, it's a first order equation is this equation, it's a first order, it has no squares in here. And by virtue of being a first order equation, it depicts the translation of a wave. And because it translates the wave, then it does, it is a, it's a wave that it doesn't change its concentration, in other words, its discharge does not change in time. Okay, it does not change in time. In fact, we can prove also that it, uh, well, the, the discharge does not change in time. So if we want to portray the movement of a kinematic wave, then we could say that as the kinematic wave moves from A to B, where A is a distance, say, 15 miles from B downstream, the wave is going in this direction. It's going to go from A to B. As the wave passes A, it looks like this, and this is what you will call the input to your reach, so your 15 mile reach. As the wave, as the wave goes through, tr through, as the wave goes through B, if it is going to be truly kinematic, it is going to look like this.
discharged in time. So it is going to be truly kinematic. It's going to be, it's not going to change in time as it moves downstream. Concentration only, that is translation only. This property has, be, has been called con translation, and that is the word that most people would agree that represents the phenomena as is. It also has been called concentration in the watershed modeling area. Uh, since we're not talking watershed modeling here, we'll leave that for the time being. It's also been called convection in the water quality modeling area. And it has also been called advection in several other places. Well, whatever. But we like this word. We prefer this word, translation, to depict the movement of the kinematic wave which travels essentially unchanged in form. And I'm going to say essentially, and I'm going to put this between quotes because it could be argued, and in fact it is true, that while the kinematic wave does not change in form, or does not change in peak, it has a curious property, because by virtue of the fact that this C is not a constant, but rather a, 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 a factor or a function of Q, then this formula is not linear, and becomes a nonlinear formula. And in actuality, what happens is that this kinematic wave, even though from the standpoint of being a one-dimensional equation, does not change in, in values, from the, from the standpoint of being nonlinear, it tends to steepen. So this kinematic wave is going to look like this as it moves down. It's going to be, it's going to pretty much remain its value, but it is going to steepen a little bit steepen a little bit, okay? If left uncontrolled, if we had a, kinema a pure kinematic wave in there, that steepening eventually would, would, would get to be uh, uh, too much of a steepening, right? If, the, if we extended these 15 miles into 150 miles, and that depends on, uh, on the actual calculations, the actual set of circumstances that we're working with, but let me say, if this, this channel becomes very long, and we allow this wave to transverse through the channel by itself uncontrolled, it eventually it'll steepen to the point where it becomes a wall of water. This is the so-called kinematic shock in the literature. You've, I'm sure you've heard about the word kinematic shock. Now you may say, what are you talking about? We've never seen this kinematic shock. And this, by the way, is a subject that has been thrown around in the literature. I wrote a paper on that subject, and in fact, uh, it's, it's part of uh, what we're going to be discussing, well, today and tomorrow, is that second paper I have shown in there, uh, back where it says three, day three. I had uh, this paper that uh, inadvertently got put in page, page three when it should have been in page two. We did, back three years ago, uh, with a student of mine, an analysis on the kinematic shock and under what circumstances is it that it could be produced. And we came up with uh, four, four conditions. We said that it'll be produced if the wave is kinematic. Ha, of course. <laughs> that almost sounds like, uh, like you're saying nothing. But let me tell you that no wave out there is actually going to be kinematic. They're kinematic only as an approximation only because we could construe them as being kinematic. But they always have a certain, a little bit of difference, okay? So therefore, if, if you can say that the wave is kinematic, if you use a kinematic wave technique, okay, an analytic kinematic wave technique, then you will have a wave that is kinematic in the laboratory, in the computational lab, in the computer, not in the real world. That's one thing. The other one has to do with the fruit number. Higher fruit numbers tend to steepen, tend to have less diffusion, physical diffusion, and therefore they tend to, to cause the onset of this kinematic shock much more, much faster, or much, uh, in a much readily, uh, much readily than if it were lower fruit number flow. And when I mean faster fruit number flow, flow I'm looking at anything close to one and even more than one. The third condition is the ratio of base flow to peak flow. And we had shown to ourselves through experiments that if the base flow is zero, you're going to have kinematic show develop rather quickly. As opposed to if you had a certain amount of base flow, which say was 50% of the total peak flow. And for reasons, as I said before, you can explore and you can look in more detail in that paper. 
And the fourth one is the shape of the cross section. If you have a, if you have a narrow enclosed canyon, you're going to have kinematic flow, the, uh, kinematic shock developing uh, much more readily, I mean, much more readily than if you had a canyon, well, a non-existent canyon, something that would expand very quickly. <laughs> there would be a flood plain. So that, of course, shows that in flood plains we cannot get kinematic shocks. As to whether the kinematic shocks exist or not, of course they do exist. The only problem is that they're very hard to document because nobody in their right mind is going to go out there and take a picture of the kinematic shock for obvious reasons. Have any of you done it? There was a kinematic shock, for instance, out in, uh, at the Colorado Big Thompson flood in 1976. I, I have no doubt in my mind that there was a kinematic shock. Uh, how many of you are familiar with that flood? It uh, killed about 150 people. They came down the Colorado Big Thompson Canyon, in, uh, and it was a very, very, um, it, 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 it was a water rising very fast. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the uh, patrolmen that went out there, uh, I guess it was late at night, 9 or 10 o'clock at night, in order to uh, uh, get every, everybody out to a high, higher ground, he was, uh, he was one of the people that got killed by the flood as it came. And, and uh, eyewitness uh, accounts tell that uh, all of a sudden they had a wall of water, which was about 10, 12 feet high, uh, rushing at speeds of on the order of 20 feet per second. And these have been calculated. Okay, so you got uh, 12, 15 foot high wall of water. That is, you can't, can't look at it in other ways. There's a kinematic shock because it was a canyon. It was a pretty much on dry, on dry uh, 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 well, you know, the uh, initial condition was a dry canyon or a very hot low flow. Then you had a, um, a the, the third condition was that it's a high fruit number flow. So you have high fruit number, a canyon, and you get all the conditions for the formation of the shock. So this is then the shock that uh, very seldom does happen in nature, but it does not happen as much in, yes, question. Uh, is, would you classify tidal bore as a uh, kinematic shock? No. Because the tidal bore is a, uh, it responds to uh, other forces. We are here talking about the kinematic shock as being the, the extreme of, or, or the effect of the nonlinearity, which is implicit in the kinematic wave equation. That this function is a form, is a, that this E is a function of Q, and therefore it tends to steepen. Any calculation in the laboratory, let us, never mind the physical world, any calculation in the laboratory that would be truly nonlinear, will steepen the shock, or will steepen the kinematic wave, and if you kept it for long enough time, it will steepen to the point where it will break down. And, but it's got to satisfy all these conditions. And, and seldom do these, are the, all these conditions satisfied in the real world. In the uh, computational world, they are satisfied because early people, early users of the kinematic wave, such as Wilhelm and others, they've used the kinematic wave, concluded there is no way in the world they're going to avoid the, the shock. In fact, Kibler said it in his, uh, in his dissertation, you know, Kibler, Dave Kibler, with the University of uh, Penn State. He, he said it in his dissertation. He said, we had run many, many models, or many kinematic wave models, and we always encountered this shock. Well, we didn't say always. He said most of the time. However, we do realize that the shock is not likely to happen out there in practice. And he says the reason may well be the fact that there is something in the equations that does not is not represented in practice or in the real world. Or I guess you could turn that statement around and, says, and say that there's something out there in the real world that is not represented in my equations. And that's why my equations are giving me shock all the time in the real world that says no, there is no shock. Not all the time, you know. He was getting 99% shock, and the real world is 1% shock as opposed to 99. So where's the problem? The problem is that the kinematic wave is imperfect. It's an imperfect equation. You may say, well, where's the imperfection? The imperfection is that Manning's is a steady flow condition. It's too stringent, too, uh, too strong a condition to impose on the unsteady flow model. So therefore, the kinematic wave, be as it is, as simple as it is, and the fact that it does give us translation is imperfect. It does not have the inherent diffusion which most natural processes have in there. It just gives us translation, solved in a, you know, in a kinematic wave form. So that is then the, um, the, uh, the kinematic wave. 
tomorrow we'll take a look at uh, the, the, a, a cousin, if you wish, the, a re relation to the kinematic wave, which is the diffusion wave, which does include a little bit of the diffusion which is present in most um, uh, real world uh, circumstances. Okay. We then conclude that kinematic waves do not diffuse, they do not attenuate, they do not decay. And for those of you that are not familiar with the word diffusion, and I have ha been asked in the past to, to define that word, diffusion means spreading, a spreading in time of something. In this case, we're spreading discharge in time. So if I wanted to impose some diffusion in here, I would have had to do this. I would have had to do this, some diffusion. And I know all of you are familiar with that, right? That's routing, <laughs> when you route to do that. When you use the Muskingum, every model of routing does provide a certain amount of diffusion. So that we are not entirely unaware or unfamiliar with this concept of diffusion. Some people call it attenuation. Some people call it decay, the decay of the wave. I've seen it also referred to as dissipation, wave dissipation, and so on and so forth. I believe that the, the proper concept is diffusion, the proper word to use in this case, but you may disagree with me. Whatever. The wave does not attenuate, the wave does not decay. Does not decay. The wave travels in a downstream only. There is no upstream kinematic wave travel for obvious reasons. There is no way to solve that to get that second answer. We should stress the fact that kinematic waves are based on steady state rating curve and that therefore they are hydrologic in nature. Although some people will disagree with me, will tend to say, oh, if we're using kinematic wave techniques, we are using hydraulic techniques. I have a different opinion. I feel that the minute you use a rating curve, then you're using a hydrologic technique. And in this case, since the kinematic wave is based on a steady rating, it is it is really hydrologic, okay? Well, I guess you could say sort of in between hydraulics and hydrology. It's, it's, it's trying to, it's a complex mathematical theory that looks like hydraulics, but it really is hydrology, okay? Cannot handle a strong backwater. Obviously, if you have backwater, then you have a rating which is different than the steady rating, and then, of course, it's not the rating that you're supposed to use for kinematic flow. So strong backwater are generally not handled with a kinematic wave technique unless you can incorporate the rating into the backwater, which is something that some people have done. The, the Soil Conservation Ser Service has been working in this area. Uh, there's a thesis out of uh, Oklahoma, a recent master's thesis that has done some work in this area. But I believe that to be in the, within the realm of our research uh, still, how to match the backwater computation to the kinematic wave technique. Because theoretically, the kinematic wave technique ought to not be confused with the backwater computation. It can steepen, though, under certain favorable conditions that I have stated and exhaustively defined in that paper that uh, these four conditions determine whether the kinematic wave is going to steepen into the shock or not. Now, the next question that we have to answer in here, before we get into the next subject, and I'm sure some of you are aware of this, and I don't mean to scare you by any, by any means, since I, I'm a guest here at, uh, at the Heck Center, you're gonna say, well, um, you have just said that the kinematic wave does not attenuate. However, when we use the Heck 1, we get a little bit of attenuation. So, what's the deal? Does it or does it not? The answer to that question is that very seldom could you actually solve the kinematic wave properly, analytically. If you do, all the time you'll run into the shock and you'll run into the absence of dissipation, steepening because of the absence of dissipation. In most cases, in most computer models that I have seen, including HEG-1, you're gonna get a small amount of dissipation just by virtue of the computer model itself, which converts the kinematic wave into a diffusion wave, sort of, into some sort of diffusion wave. Remember I said a while ago, 
So physically, you can add a little bit of diffusion, and nature does it through the kinematic wave, and therefore eliminates the possibility of the shock in all cases. Just a few cases will develop the shock. 99% it would not. Well, the same, you've got the same case with, uh, with the computer models. And then they, they incorporate a small amount of diffusion into the computations such that the wave looks kinematic, but it does not develop the shock, and it is more practical in that sense. Because uh, you would agree with me, if your HEC-1 model did not have any physical diffusion, it would be unworkable. Simply unworkable. Because it will be creating the shock all the time. And you as a user don't want to have to contend with the shock. Especially a shock that's not there. You know, not a shock. If it's there, fine. But if it's not there, forget it. So there is this amount of diffusion in there that, uh, that it is necessary for the model to, to be a practical, routine model uh, used by many people without having to run into, into problems. So that leads us to the model which I call, and as well as many people in Europe, call the diffusion wave technique. Strelkov, in a paper that he wrote uh, many years ago, he called it the zero inertia wave. I must say at this time that the zero inertia is exactly the same concept in the diffusion wave. So if you see any of them, they mean one and the same thing. Um, in the recent book by Linsley, the third edition of Linsley, uh, he um, dedicates uh, a section, a small section, to what he calls the zero inertia waves. And you know, it's a small section in the, in the, in the hydrology book. Because you know, this is a relatively new concept. Although I should take that, uh, I should qualify that, because the concept of diffusion has been around as going back to the work of Hayami in 1951. Hayami did what is considered to be a, wrote what is considered to be a classical paper in the literature of flood routing. He wrote a paper and he said, uh, let's assume that these waves follow a diffusion equation. I don't know how he got to that conclusion, but he got to it. He, he did it. He modeled the diffusion equation. He got a theoretical analytical solution for the diffusion equation, which could be gotten, by the way, sinusoidal and so on and so forth. And he proceeded to test his equation with data. And he showed to himself, as well as to other people that read his book, that his data matches his, his, uh, his theory. And then he published his paper. And ever since, he has been recognized as perhaps the, one of the pioneers in this method, the diffusion wave technique. Light and Whittem later, 1955, expounded on what Ayami had done, as well as many other people. Unfortunately, they stressed the kinematic wave as opposed to the diffusion wave. So if you read the paper by Light and Whittem, and certainly I urge you to, like I say, go ahead and uh, if, you, if you can, if you can't get through it. I, I have had a hard time getting it through that paper several times because it's a highly complicated theoretical paper. But unfortunately, like it and Wyrm does emphasize the concept of kinematic wave to the detriment of its near, near re related cousin, the diffusion wave. So it's at the, in the back of that paper, which is about 50, 50 pages long, by the time you get to paper, uh, page 30 or 40, you're tired. You can't get to the diffusion wave, which is there, by the way, to be read and, and understood and, and take it from there. Okay? Notice that flat waves, in general, do diffuse every time we do a calculation. I should not say every time. Most times we do a calculation, whether we use mass kingdom or whether we use level, uh, level pool storage indication, any method that you care, it's going to look like this. It's going to be a small amount of diffusion. In fact, uh, Price at their um, Natu Natural Environment Research Council report, written in England uh, 12 years ago, the flood studies report that I'm sure some of you have uh, gotten a hold of, he says that he can use his diffusion wave technique provided the diffusion is within 30%. That's what he said. So if I have in here, say, 1,000 CFS, provided I have in here 300 CFS, then he says he could use his diffusion wave technique. I'm pretty sure of that. It could be 20 or 30%, but whatever. He says, uh, we are justified in using the diffusion wave technique provided the diffusion is within 30%, with a certain small percentage practical percentage, because it is not likely that the waves are going to have anything more than 30% for a simple reason, which is somehow, like it's a common sense reason, but not very common. <laughs> you know how they say it. 
that if the wave did diffuse to say 30% uh, of what it was before, instead of 30, you know, say 70%, if diffused to here, let's say we have in here 700, okay? You follow me? 700 in there and here 300. That if the way within a short reach, say within 15 miles down the road or down the stream, I should say, if it diffused from 1,000 to 300 CFS, you wouldn't be interested in calculating it. It would be a wave that diffuses too fast. It would not be a wave for design conditions. It may well be a wave for, for flat forecasting. But you know, we've got to draw the line between flat forecasting and design. In design condition, you're looking at the worst possible condition. In flat forecasting, you want to look at the, the, the event as it happens, so it's a much tougher job. But let's leave aside for the moment the, the flat forecasting. If it were like this, we wouldn't be interested in it. In fact, the reason why we use HEC2 and we get by with it is because of that. Because HEC2 doesn't change the discharge, right? HEC2 doesn't change the discharge. Because the, short, the reach is so small that you don't care. The discharge is going to decrease from 1,000 to 950. So, so what? 1,000 is more conservative anyway. You see? So there's a reason why the HEC2 model works is because we don't want this discharge to decrease. For that matter, this discharge does not decrease. Whoever saw a discharge that decreases actually it doesn't happen, it increases because it has tributary inflow. It's, it's true that it decreases to 700, but that's if, if it will be alone, and it's not. It's hardly ever alone. As you go downstream, you have the tributary flows, and the discharge looks more like this, 1,500. Because once you consider in the routing the tributary flow, and depending, of course, on the drainage from the channels and so on and so forth, the discharge, as it goes downstream, is likely to increase rather than decrease. So it decreases a little bit due to the flood condition in the channel, and it increases a whole lot due to the lateral inflow. You see? So there's that's that difference right there. So, so this is then the, the concept of diffusion wave. In fact, the reason why the kinematic wave is used so much, in lieu of the diffusion wave, which presumably is better, it's because the diffusion is so small that you can go ahead and neglect it or approximately uh, uh, model it as in HEC1 or other methods and not miss too much of it. Let's say the answer is, uh, is uh, 7,500 or 750, the true answer to this problem. And HEC1 is giving us 700 or, or close to that value. So we're so close, you know, we're so close. And besides, this particular aspect is being masked by the, con the whole concept of hydrologic modeling which contains six or seven aspects. And very seldom, unless you're in a research area, you cannot separate them. You, go, you get the input, the model, and the output. You cannot go in the model and say, how am I gonna now separate these various components? So you cannot, as a user, separate. So you hardly ever see this. You hardly ever have a chance to see. In fact, I don't know how many of you have ever have a chance to see the actual attenuation, to, to really have a feel for the actual numerical attenuation of the HEC1 model. I don't know, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think many, many actually people even look at that situation. I, I was lecturing last year in San Diego and one guy said, yeah, I use the HEG-1 model. And uh, he was talking, you know, and he said, um, um, yeah, it gives us the discharges. And I said, yeah, well, yeah, that's good. It, no problem with that, but, but it says, uh, he has a little bit, I said, he does have this, this, this problem, quote unquote, of the attenuation, which is masked. And he said, no. He said, no, it doesn't. I don't think so. So, so see, here we got into an argument <laughs> whether it has or it doesn't, you know. So, so at any rate, so I went back to the office and I brought my, my, my HEG manual and I read the HEG 1 manual where it says it does have attenuation. So I guess I was a little bit nasty. Um, you know, the, the HEG manual does say that it has attenuation somewhere in there. But you really got to read the whole manual before you can actually read that little part in there. Okay? So, that's the attenuation. A small amount of diffusion, hey, how about that? I say 20% in here. Well, that is my feeling, but if you go back to, uh, to uh, flood studies report, I believe they actually say 30% in here. Can be represented in the diffusion wave equation, which is related to the kinematic wave equation, but it looks like this. Now, you will agree with me that in here, in the first part of this, this equation, we have what amounts to the, to the kinematic wave equation, right? That is what we derived rather quickly, but we did derive it as the kinematic wave equation. Now, I'm going to, well, you're going to have to take my word for it, because I'm not going to do it, because it'll take two hours. 
to put this term in here. And it's in there, by the way. It's somewhere in there. It's in page uh, 5, 512. No, no, it's not there. Somewhere, no, it, it's in there, but somewhere else. Let me just uh, find it. Hmm. How about that? I'm going to have to look into this in more detail. Well, there has been many developments for the diffusion wave equation. And I believe in here, I have given you only one. Oh, yeah, 5.3 and 5.4 and 5.5. Five. Go over that, that. That's a very complex development. I don't intend to get into that. Um, but eventually, you get to this equation. Notice that this equation has a difference. There's a difference between this equation. This equation is, is shown in... Uh, um, somewhere in there. <laughs> This is not very well put together. Whatever. 513? Yeah, 513, I think. OK? Equation 513? OK. Yeah, oh, equation 523 is somewhat written as equation 523, although then I say this component here is C, and the other one is mu. So, so that is equation 523, OK? So notice that this equation differs from the kinematic wave equation in that it contains a second order term. Now, you go back to your mathematics, and they tell you that if you have a second order term, you've got a diffusion term in there. Specifically, in the way this is written. This equation is written, it produces a diffusion. And this is a diffusion coefficient, which was identified by Hayami, Leihir, and Wittem. Um, Henderson, as well as many other people, have identified this diffusion coefficient in the past. This is the hydraulic diffusivity. This term controls to a large extent. In fact, it is the term that controls the diffusion more than any other term, more than any other um, component in all the equations that we wish to care with, or we care to work with. Uh, this, this term in here is determinant on the diffusion that is going to take place. Let's take a look at this term because it's a very important term. Is the discharge over the, over the uh, top width divided by the slope, twice the slope? Now, if we look at this equation, we're going to find something very interesting. And it is the fact that if the slope is 0, the diffusion is infinite, right? Which is correct, basically correct. If you have a, a condition where the slope is zero, you're going to have a swamp. If you have a swamp, the diffusion is infinite. And we go back to the example that I gave you this morning on the Alto Para Y. That is a swamp. It's the huge, the biggest swamp in the world. It's about, what did I say, 600,000 square miles? 600,000 square miles. And therefore, the diffusion is infinite. There is a po maximum possible diffusion that could happen. What's the answer to that, to that hydrograph? The hydrograph looks like this. Actually, the diffusion is not infinite in there. If it were infinite, it would be base flow. But it's, there's so much diffusion, right? If it were infinite, it would be totally, totally obliterated. But that's not the case. There is so much diffusion in there, there's still some. Because I would say the, uh, the, um, it's a very small slope, OK, on that order. I guess we were looking at zeros this morning, uh, say on the order of eight or something like that. Very small slope, which produces this excessive diffusion in the watershed, huge basin, which gives us this almost perfect sinusoidal wave as the response of that basin from a year-to-year -year basis. OK? On the other hand, it also tells us another important concept. And it is that if you have a steep slope, the diffusion is very small. Right? If you have a steep slope, I'm using this in the wrong way. If you have a steep slope, the greater this is, the, the, the smaller this is, and the, then, of course, since this term is already small compared to these other two, for obvious reasons, it's a second order term, it's got to be small. Then this product then is a small times a small. Then we conclude that for a, for a slope that is steep, the diffusion is going to be very nil, which supports the experience that we know that um, in the steep slopes, on the order of one, greater than 1%, 3%, 5%, you're going to have very little diffusion. And therefore, this term is going to drop out, which supports, again, the experience of most every user of the kinematic wave, which says that 
the greater the slope, the better the kinematic wave is in describing the phenomena. So, I would say, and I have said this in the past, I would say that anything, based on my experience, and those of you that have other experience, please let me know, anything above greater, above 1% is definitely kinematic. And that's why the kinematic flow theory is used so much for urban hydrology, the so-called urban hydrology. I guess some people don't like that uh, term. <laughs> so other people like to call it stormwater drainage or whatever. Uh, anything above 1% is definitely kinematic. That is provided you minimize or live with, learn to live with the, 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 the small diffusion which is in there. Okay? Anything above, and I'm going to say in here 0.001 is in the realm of diffusion wave. And anything below 0.001, and I would even, even go as far as to say this, and allow me to do this, since I'm talking about this subject, I'm supposed to be defending it, right? So I know uh, um, uh, Danny Fred is going to come in, in a couple of days and he may say something entirely different, okay? Uh, I'm going to extend this to 0 0.001 or perhaps in between somewhere. Well, at this point you've got a gray area which we're going to delimit later on. But we go from the steep slopes, let me point it out here in a qualitative way so as to not to give you any, for the steep slopes, we have kinematic wave equation, kinematic wave model, which should work, okay, greater than 0.1. For the not so steep slopes, <laughs> not so steep slopes, say less than uh, the slope in between uh, less than 0.01 and greater than, uh, in here, let's say 0 0.001, 0 0.005, something on that order, you're going to have the diffusion wave equation. And here we go now, in the mild slopes, and that's the slope greater uh, or uh, less than 0 0.0005, and I stress that this, this number here is subject to, to criticism, okay? And greater than, than zero, of course. Zero is the minimum slope, right? Slope less than zero. Then the real question is, should we adopt these models and go with the full dynamic wave equation? dynamic wave equation. And uh, I'm sure the proponents of the dynamic wave equation would like me to keep it that way. But I'm not going to. I'm going to put a big question mark in here. Because experience has shown to many people that have used these models that in certain circumstances the dynamic wave equation may not be there. Okay, it, it's okay when you, it, it's good model to use when you have a need to precisely define discharges and stages, very precisely. Then, of course, you cannot do it with, a, with an approximate model. Uh, of course, you may say, well, what is precise uh, from a design standpoint? Well, we'll leave that subject a, as is. But uh, in here, the dynamic wave equation needs to be understood in that sense, that it is the, our best tool but there are these approximations, specifically this approximation, that in many uh, places uh, uh, is considered to be as good as the dynamic wave model. We go a step by step. This is uh, the coarsest, this is refined, and this is the best, our best estimate of what, of what we can do. Okay? Um, so that is the, the diffusion wave and the hydraulic diffusivity. An extension, oh well, the, the diffusion could be, is obtained by linearization and many people have criticized that and say, well, you know, the world is non-linear, it's non-linear. Well, you know, well, you gotta cut it somewhere, you know. For modeling purposes, we all realize that you cannot solve the complete problem. If you were to solve the complete problem, perhaps we would got to go back to the, to the, uh, to the clouds where the water originates, right? And take it all the way to the tidal flow. And I, certainly that's not the case. We've got to cut it down to pieces. We've got heg one, heg two, uh, clouds, and so on. You know, the formation of the meteorology, the hydrology, the hydraulics, the tidal flow, and so on. But uh, we have fruit number independence in here, which is technically not quite right, because uh, the diffusivity is related to the fruit number in, in a way that I will show later on. 
So this, in general, is considered to apply to practical applications in low fruit number flows. And I believe that to be the reason why, for instance, uh, uh, Seven did say that it, you know, his calculations show that the kinematic wave uh, applies, the kinematic and diffusion wave, you know, together, they apply for, they satisfied his data because he was working with low fruit number flows. When the flows get to be high fruit number, then in some instances, we can show to ourselves that we have to include the inertia in there. And we can come up with this equation. And I re refer you to the literature for this equation. You can go back to Lyell and Whittam. You can go back to Doug in a paper in Hi uh, Journal of Hydrology, recent paper, 1982, um, and several others. And in fact, you can, uh, uh, a change or a, an improvement on this equation has been presented by myself in a paper that I recently put together in Hydraulics Division in 1986, in August. So I refer you to that paper for an improvement on this equation considering the effect of the beta, uh, which as you know, beta varies from 5 thirds all the way to 3 when we have a laminar flow condition in the overland flow, uh, overland flow condition. But at any rate, whether we improve this or not, by incorporating the fruit number equal 2, and the reason why this equation works and it has theoretical basis is because for a fruit number equal to what happens in here? It corrects the diffusion and the diffusion drops out of the picture, right? And that is in fact the way it happens. Because as I already told you a while ago, that for fruit number equal to we get no diffusion. In fact, for fruit number equal to, and I'm going to say it now, kinematic diffusion and dynamic waves behave in the same way. They all amount to one thing. You cannot separate them for fruit number equal to. Okay? That is where they all coalesce. We here have a steady state rating. Whether we have a steady state rating or not, well, that depends. Uh, for most practical purposes, we would like to have a steady state rating because that's the, the one that we most readily can get a hold of. In certain cases, we may have a, a gradually steady flow rating or even an unsteady flow rating, which I'll have a chance to talk a little bit more in detail later on. Well, I repeat in here, for fruit number equal to 2, the diffusivity is equal to 0 as for the dynamic wave. We have shown in this paper, by the way, in this paper that I published in Hydraulics Division last August, as well as in another paper that is currently under review, not yet, yet seen the light, we have shown that this model for the overland flow case does not improve on the previous model. And we're still investigating as to reasons why, is the, why that is the case. I can't tell you at this point because it's current of my sub, uh, subject of my current research right now. This model is supposed to be better than the previous one, right? I, again, I repeat, this model here is a fruit number diffusivity. The previous one is a fruit number independent diffusivity. And because of the fact that we have inertia in here, and we don't have inertia in the previous number, then this is supposed to be better. However, extensive tests have shown, I have shown to myself through extensive tests that, that the better features are not there. They're, the answers come out so, so close, you know, like for instance, we have a peak flow, which is, uh, in one ca case it is 100, zero, when I use that as a benchmark, and the other case is 99.98. And the 99.98 is better than the 100. <laughs> and you can say, well, what are you talking about? From a practical standpoint, we don't care about the difference. So let's just, like I said, subject to current research that whether this formula improves on the previous formula or not. And the question is as to why is it? May we, in, in the answer to that question may well lie the, 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 quest, the, the answer to the question as to whether the dynamic wave model is indeed the way to go or not in unsteady flow modeling. I can refer you to the paper by Basco that he's going to publish in Hydraulics the Division National Conference in Williamsburg. He has titled his paper, and I'm trying to draw from memory here because I read it this summer, I mean this summer, this, uh, this Sunday, because uh, it just came out. I'm sure uh, many of you have, have received that uh, brochure, right? The Williamsburg Conference. And the, the, the title of his paper is, Is the Dynamic Wave Model the model to use in all instances? It's a question mark paper. And I've tried to get a hold of Basco. I'm going to try to get a hold of Basco so he can send me a copy of that paper because, as you can see, I'm very much interested in that subject. I have been for many years. Uh, so that is what Basco is going to, is going to say. Uh, how many of you know, you know Professor Basco, right? He used to be at Texas A&M. Now he's uh, in Virginia somewhere. 
Okay. So that is the diffusion wave equation with inertia, which is as close as we're ever going to get to the dynamic wave model, and yet remaining within the within the purview of purview of uh, diffusion wave and kinematic wave models, approximate models of the full blown equations. I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, I want, to, I want to talk about rating curves, because rating curves are very important for us to understand what is it that we're doing in here when we talk about unsteady flow. There's three types of rating. First, what's a rating? It's a relationship between discharge and stage. There's a steady uniform rating, which one can calculate by posing a Manning flow condition. Variation of stage, different area, different velocity, different discharge, and so on and so forth, right? So that gives us this solid line. If, on the other hand, we had a control somewhere, a control, that control is going to impose a change in the rating. And that change is going to be reflected at a certain cross-section in a somewhat different rating. Still steady, but somewhat different. I call this the steady, non-uniform, if you wish, backwater, OK? Or not necessarily backwater. It could be drawdown, too. So that's, that's a misnomer in here. So we backwater slash drawdown. So that's the steady, the, um, the, uh, steady non-uniform flow rating. And then on top of that, we've got the unsteady flow rating. It is well known that an unsteady flow model has the virtue or the quality, the characteristic of generating its unsteady flow rating. At every cross section, the discharge in the rising limb is lower than the discharge. I'm sorry, this is, I don't know where this is. I don't know if this is reversed or something. The discharge in the rising limb goes up like this. And yeah, that's right, it produces a stage. I guess I should reverse that. The stage in the rising limb is less than the stage in the receding limb. OK? Let's not talk about this, let's talk about the stage. The state, how less? That's a qu big question that we have to answer. And I'm sure this course will answer that question in many ways. You will be able to calculate the effect of that loop. OK? Needless to say, if that loop, um, well, the unsteady flow generates its own rating. The size of the loop depends on the, flow, depends on the flow itself. If you have a flow that is like this, that generates a certain rating, loop rating, which may look like this. OK? Going up and coming down. If, on the other hand, you have a flow that looks like this, then that generates, OK, its other rating. And the rating looks like that. If you have a, yet another flow that is very highly peaked, like a flash flood, OK, and the flash flood looks like this. You see what I'm doing? I'm keeping the discharge, and I'm reducing the time frame. If you reduce the time frame, you're introducing dy dynamics into the situation. The dynamic components are becoming more and more preponderant. They're, they're, they're growing in importance compared to everything else. So you're going to have a lot of diffusion. The more, the more you have this, this uh, constraint now, or I, I guess you could say uh, the suddenness, the more the sudden, the rise and fall of the hydrograph, the more diffusion you're going to have, and the more the, and the, here I am exaggerating, totally exaggerating the way this is going to come out. But I have calculated uh, rating curves that, that don't look like that, but they look more like number two, OK? So when you have a strong dynamic component, you're going to have a, a strong rating, a strong loop in the rating. The width of the loop is a measure of the flow unsteadiness. And that, are, again, has been demonstrated in the literature. And that the simplified methods assume that the loop is small. So if you have a condition where you don't care about the loop, or sometimes you don't want to care about it, or whatever, or you feel you cannot document it, or whatever. Then you're in a good position to talk about kinematic and diffusion wave models. If, on the other hand, the loop is all important, it is necessary that you really describe this difference in precisely minute detail, then you should go to a dynamic wave model, because the dynamic wave model is our best current, best answer to the question of the size of the loop. However, this is the steady flow condition. And the loop is going to, dynamic wave loop is going to be more or less like this. OK, so you're going to be able to document the various changes. And depending on, on the river situation that you may have, that width may be one foot, two foot, three feet, I don't know. 
okay? Don't forget, though, that uh, the cost of the loop is not just due to hydrodynamic and steady flow reasons. You can have changes in the bottom, which are producing a loop by itself to be superimposed on this loop. I once talked to a fellow that was a sediment man, and I said, the loop is like this. And he says, oh, wait a second. You're kidding me. I have seen loops that, looks like this, that look like this. And he has documented in Mississippi in several places where the loops look like an eight. Of course, that doesn't obey hydrodynamics. That obeys the, the variations in friction. The Manning's end, as it changes in with the stage, the Manning end changes, the ripples, the dunes, and all that you know, good sedimentation stuff that I'm sure you will have a chance to, to, to view some other time. That stuff also has an effect on the loop. So the real, real loop, you may not be able to calculate it with a rigid boundary model such as the Whopper or any of the hydraulics model. You'll have to go to a hex six or fluvial or whatever other type that, uh, that takes account of the loop in the rating. I have to take that back. I don't know whether hex six does the uh, Manning's end variation. No friction changes. OK, so I take it back. I don't, think, I, don't see, I don't see how you can do it. There are no tools for us to do that. At this, uh, there, the, so there are some tools, but they are still at the research stage. Uh, I have a friend of mine, for instance, I would mention to you uh, out there in um, Portugal that did a PhD at Colorado many years ago, and he attempted to do this sort of thing. You know, the change in the loop with the, uh, with the Manning's end, but that's a very complicated subject yet in the research stage. So let's forget about these eights in the loops which are there, but not to be uh, concerned at this point. There is still this loop in here, which somewhat experience tells us that if the loop is going to be narrow, then it is going to be kinematic. If the loop is going to be wide, then it's going to be dynamic. If the loop is going to be in between somewhat of a loop, but not too big, then it's going to be this diffusion wave loop. OK. I say this concept of, of, of loop is very important because we have the boundary conditions. We, in a hydraulic model such as the Whopper, or for that matter, in a diffusion model such as the one that Strelkov has documented for HEC many years ago, See, the, you can, the kinematic models do not have a downstream control. The dynamic models have downstream control. The diffusion models don't have to have a downstream control. They could, but they may not, okay? So there, there's where you get your classification between the three. If you absolutely don't care about the downstream control, then you can be kinematic or diffusion. If you do, then you go down to the dynamic wave, okay? The diffusion waves, those that are based on steady flow cannot handle the downstream boundary. They will have to be implemented somehow. The dynamic waves can handle a downstream boundary because you cannot pose a, a model, a numerical model such as Priceman scheme that you're going to, Danny is going to talk about. We're solving the complete equations, you cannot do that unless you pose a downstream boundary condition that is fundamental to the modeling, that you have to know the downstream boundary condition before you can actually do the calculation in the interior points. You're going to know the upstream boundary condition, which is a discharge, and you normally know a, you have to pose or you have to come up with a downstream boundary condition. Okay. And this is a, a view a little bit on hydraulic river routing, some of the things you're going to be doing later on. You have, let's say we, we divide the river into five stretches, tre stretches, five reaches, or four reaches rather, five points, and you, you know the Q1, these are the discharges, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and Q5. And you know Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4. You have 10 unknowns, actually only nine unknowns, or eight, really. You can only have eight unknowns, because you only have two equations and four reaches. So two times four is eight. You have got to have two conditions. And for this problem to be properly posed, you've got to have one condition upstream, one condition downstream. Normally, the condition is discharge upstream, stage downstream. However, the discharge upstream is no problem, because you can get a hydrologic model such as one to give you the discharge, or any other model. OK? But the downstream boundary is a little bit sticky. As I say in there, upstream boundary is known, leaves nines unknowns. Eight equations, one more equation is needed. So we need, an, we need an additional equation, Q function of Y, or Y known. Obviously, we cannot know Y. If we know Y, then we presume we know the answer before we start solving the problem. 
And that certainly is not the case, right? We cannot know why. All we can know is a relationship between Q and Y. And that will give us another equation so that we can throw it in there and, and determine the problem based on eight equations and eight unknowns. So the relationship between Q and Y, and here is where this problem becomes a little bit fuzzy. And it is the sense that the unsteady flow rating is difficult to obtain. Because if you had the unsteady flow rating, then it pretty much amounts to knowing the answer, right? You know the answer, all you're trying to do is fill in the, the blanks. You know the answer downstream and you're filling in the blanks inside, which is where presumably you are interested in finding what the answer is. But it is a very hard thing to do, you would agree with me, to know the answer downstream. A looped rating curve is a hard thing to do. A rating curve, yes, but a loop rating curve? However, it can be done in the mathematics, and the models do it, and I do it, and I believe the Whopper does it. It has a, the Whopper has a feature in there by which they actually recalculate or back calculate or feedback, if you wish, so that they can get the loop in the rating. And in fact, I'm not the best per person to answer that question. It's Danny Fred, actually, to answer exactly how is it that it is done. This can be done in two ways. Either, either you feedback and recalculate and have the loop in the rating be created at a downstream point, so that therefore you can feed back to the interior points and calculate the loops as they are, right? So you have a, a channel in here, one, two, three, four, five. And you gotta have a loop in the rating in here so that you can calculate the loop in the rating in the others. Otherwise, you have a situation in which in here there is no unsteady flow and this is impinging or al al altering the results, the actual unsteady flow effects in here. And I'm not the only one that has said that. Has said this. You could go back to the literature. You can go to Abbott. You can go to many places where this this problem is described. So there's one way that could be done is by feedback. And another way that could be done, and in fact I have done it as, many, as well as many other people successfully, and that is to artificially extend the channel downstream. How do you do that? Let me repeat that. How do you artificially extend the channel downstream? So you consider the down, the channel to be like this, from A to B, say 10 miles. And then you consider another channel in here, maybe 50 miles from B to C. And in C, you impose a steady rating. But because you're doing this calculation backwards and forwards, as it is done with the, the Whopper model, by the time this contaminated rating gets to B, it's pure. And it looks good. And believe me, it works. In other words, it looks like a, like a loop. It's not a loop at C. By no means, but it's a loop at B, and that's what we want. And of course, this part in here does not at all enter into our computations. It does not exist, okay? However, it is a good gimmick to get the work done, and it does it. It does it, okay? So that is, is uh, although at the expense of complexity, or rather, not complexity, but rather a lot more computer, computer utilization and so on. I have extended my, <laughs> Do I have 15 more minutes? I gotta finish here. Uh, we took too long to do this. We came to the most important part. Applicability. Applicability. This is where I'm going to rely upon my own work. How good are the kinematic and diffusion models? And we have shown in the literature, I can refer you back to a paper written by myself and and Simons in, back in 1978, where, um, where we developed theoretical values for the applicability of the kinematic wave model based on dimensionless numbers. And these are similar to the Wilhizer and Liggett famous kinematic flow number, but there is a difference. And the Wilhizer and Liggett was working with overland flow conditions, and their length was the length of the channel, the overland flow channel, which was limited, which was, oh, I don't know, 300 feet, 500 feet. And here we have a T which is, which is unlimited. T could be anything. And T is the hydrograph time base. So if you multiply the hydrograph time base times the slope of the channel, times a representative velocity over a rep representative depth, and here we're sort of fuzzy a little bit as to what is representative. You gotta admit, you know, if you're gonna do your recipe, it has to be simple, you know. So that is representative, you know, mean, say average, good, good value for the velocity. And this is 171 for a 5% error in the, in the computation. That means that the wave's not gonna diffuse too much. It's gonna remain within the concept of being, of being kinematic. 
Um, as far as the diffusion wave is concerned, we did the same thing. Yes? Is your uh, representative velocity and depth average velocity depth of the speed wall? To tell you the truth, uh, there's a sticky question. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's a sticky subject to get into. My answer would be uh, the, the mean flow between the best answer, and this is all qualitative, but the best answer you could get, and it's not going to be that much different, I don't think, uh, would be to get a value in between mean, I mean, uh, base and peak. So if your base is zero, then it would be halfway in between zero and peak. But I do realize that for practical purposes, you may want to use the peak flow because it's the only one you can get a hold of. So, you know, you can go ahead, but the way I derived this was based on mean flow rather than peak flow. Okay, so um, we did the same thing for the diffusion wave, and we came up with a slightly modified formula or parameter, which by the way, it's also a dimensionless parameter, which says that if this, con if this parameter satisfies this condition, then it is a diffusion wave, and we have some examples that show, depending on the, based on the slopes, how, how much it could be. Uh, and we show, of course, that the, the diffusion wave has more applicability that the kinematic wave and uh, the waves that um, could be up, could be modeled as diffusion waves are going to be are going to have attenuation varying between zero and thirty percent within a reasonable time within within a time of propagation. Notice that the product of t times s is the controlling factor because it appears in these two formulas, and furthermore, they are the ones that vary most. You know, you will agree with me that the velocity doesn't vary too much. The depth doesn't vary too much with an order of magnitude. But the slope varies, four orders of magnitude. The time of rise, or time base in this case, could vary anywhere from, uh, from two hours to uh, three months. You know, it varies two, three, four orders of magnitude. So the product of T times S. So if we multiply Ts and we get a number, well, in, in the, if we want to do it dimensionless, we have to do it following these formulas and we get a big number, then these models are then applicable. That is the reason why Seddon was right. Because even though he had a small slope to contend with, right, lower Mississippi, he still had such a long time that the long time overwhelmed the small slope. On the other hand, if you go to, the, to over, uh, urban hydrology and mountain streams, you have the opposite condition. You have a very short time of rise and down, or bay time base, but you have such a steep slope that it overwhelms the time. And right there, you know, that is the question, I believe the answer to the question of applicability of these approximate models. In summary, we use approximate models, kinematic and diffusion waves in problems with little or no downstream control. Preferably, we use a diffusion wave instead of the kinematic wave, unless a strong case can be made for the use of a kinematic wave. And like I said, the HEC-1 model, I believe, uh, the kinematic wave in the HEC-1 model, I believe it to be a diffusion wave. So for reasons that tomorrow we'll discuss, okay? So if you're saying, oh, the HEC-1 doesn't use diffusion wave, that's not true? It uses it. It just doesn't call it that, but it, it uses it. Be aware that numerical solutions of the kinematic wave are in fact diffusion waves. So I stated what I just said, okay? Because of numerical diffusion. Situations of strong downstream control, inflow to reservoirs, very mild bed slopes, tidal and estuary flow may in certain cases warrant the use of dynamic waves like it's recognized by everybody. And dynamic wave solutions are not completely unsteady unless you can solve the problem of the specifying the boundary condition downstream. If you can cope with that and it can be done, although at the uh, expense of resources, computer resources, then, then it will become completely unsteady and you can really solve your problem in the most, in the finer way that you could possibly do, given the tools that we have at our disposal at this time. With that, I would like to open it up for questions. I know I have a, sort of a, exceeded my time a little bit. Um, tomorrow morning we're gonna we're gonna continue a little bit more on this subject, and um, any questions? Well, I hope tomorrow morning we have some questions. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. <laughs> I just wanted to 
just like to uh, point out, I, just, I guess you didn't have time to, to really discuss it, but the actual measurement of a looped rating curve in the real world is almost never done. That is, we get USGS measurements that are then collapsed to a unique rating curve, whereas they may indeed, in fact, have been a loop to begin with. So they give it to you as a, as a unique? Well, because in order to measure a loop rating curve, you have to have somebody out there throughout the whole plot. You bet. You bet. And it is a tough job because not only do you have to be out there, you got to be measuring it and it may become dangerous for the person that's doing it. That's what I said a while ago, that it's very hard to document the flat waves, I mean the, the, the wall waves. It is that they may in fact be there but not be in the data. So be careful when you're uh, calibrating or whatever your model is that kind of data. My feeling is that the loops are always there. The question is how big they are. Theory tells us that if the wave is kinematic, the loop is so small that it's not worth even bothering. And the opposite, that if the wave is a dynamic wave, the loop is likely to be there and it has to be accounted for. Okay, thank you very much.